Saint John of the Cross, saint, Spaniard, and poet. Best known for his poem, Dark Night of the Soul, he spoke of love and joy, that happiness that only the Father can provide. Like with Saint Teresa of Avila, his only true desire was to achieve that complete union when he and the Lord would be one. As we turn the pages of the life of St. John of the Cross, you will discover a powerful woman in the life of this powerful man. The story of St. John cannot be told without St. Teresa. God was to use her to change the course of his life. At times she led him, and at other times she leaned on him. He was free to recognize, love, and follow this controversial woman who with him would unseat and ruffle the feathers of the church and the world of 16th century Spain. Avila, the land of St. Teresa and John of the Cross. We celebrate this year the fourth centenary of the death of John of the Cross. We'd like to bring you on a pilgrimage today, on a pilgrimage of two of the greatest saints and doctors of our church, Teresa and John. He became John of the Cross, and she, she lived the cross. At one point, Jesus said to her, you are not worthy before, but today I take you as my very own bride, and everything I have is yours and everything that you have belongs to me. We wanted to share with you John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. But as we researched more and more the lives of these two powerful men and women in the church, we found men and women working together to reform the Carmelite order of the 16th century in Spain and also to cast their shadow on history up until today, two doctors of the church, two powerful people that worked for our Lord Jesus. And as you walk with us through their lives, through the rooms, on the cobble streets that they walked, you're going to find two distinctly individual personalities, but they complemented one another. Each one of them died to their Lord emptied themselves so that the Lord would be able to fill them. And what was created was a dynamic duo for the Lord. They loved the Jesus that they discovered in one another. They loved the Jesus that ruled their life. You are in a land of contradiction, a land of passion, and all the beautiful ingredients of the Spanish people, that of the poet, is alive in St. John. That of the ordinary, simple people of this beautiful, hard land is in Teresa, who found her Lord not only in the Blessed Sacrament, but amongst the pots and pans. Teresa talks of castles, interior castles, in back of us, you see the walls of the city of Avila, the walls that were there when St. Teresa was born. But St. Teresa talks more importantly about castles in the mind, castles in the spirit. And we're going to share with you as we go through this time with John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, how Teresa helps us to go farther and farther towards unity with the Lord. We're so excited. We're so thrilled. We belong to such a beautiful church. And here, there's such evidence of it. Everywhere we went, every foundation, and we're going to be walking through them with you. Medina, Valladolid, Salamanca. Segovia, Alba de Tormes, where Teresa died and is buried. One thing that we got throughout, one thing that Teresa insisted on was alegria, joy. She insisted there be no long-faced nuns, and that is part of her reform order. Everyone that we've met has been joyful. 
Teresa, John of the Cross, our Lord raised up at a time when it looked like the end for the church. He raised up two saints, humble, obedient, loving, lovable, two doctors who we today are trying to walk in their light. On December 14th, 1990, we begin the centenary, the fourth centenary of the death of John of the Cross. And so we'd like to dedicate this documentary to the memory and the works of this great doctor of the church, John of the Cross. And John, of course, would not have been John of the Cross without his mentor, Teresa of Avila. Travel with us, hold hands, get ready. You're about to join a brother and sister who lived 400 years ago to bring you the truth that is alive today. He was born of peasants in Fonteveros, where the land and the weather can be an enemy, but to the poor of which he was a part, it could be a killer. John, along with his two brothers and widowed mother, were colder and hungrier than most. His mother tried unsuccessfully to eke out a living doing some weaving. Not even her husband's relatives willing to help, the little family had to move to Medina del Campo or starve. Here the little band would know some relief. They would be able to find work and therefore food. John, the youngest son, found a job in the hospital. This brought some money into the house and still enabled him to go to school. All the deprivation he had known, physical and emotional, had not affected his will or his mind. Right from the beginning, he showed himself to be enthusiastic and brilliant. God began molding John through the Society of Jesus, a new company of men founded by Ignatius Loyola. Although this would influence St. John and his walk to the Lord, his road was to be different. He was being called to be a new saint, one who would touch lives that possibly Loyola could not. So God would use this training, but would fashion him uniquely through himself and for himself. Now in St. John's day, with young men either joining a religious order or adventuring by sea to far off lands, it was not surprising for a young man like John to enter a religious house. The Carmelite order appealed to him. The tradition of those who had gone before him strengthened him. It offered him the security he needed that it was the one God wanted him to embrace. Months passed quickly for John as a novice. He loved it all, the solemn voices, the Bible, the Holy Mass. But like novices before and after him, he was always being tested. John obeyed. This would be a stronghold for him in later years when that yes would be so painful. After six months of the novitiate, he professed his final vows, donned the scapular of the fully confirmed Carmelite, and left to study Latin and philosophy in Salamanca. Life in the University of Salamanca was heaven and hell. Although I am sure many times St. John wished he could fade into the background, as Jesus said, you cannot hide a light under a bushel basket. Whenever one in a community shines more brightly than the others, there is bound to be envy, and that envy will not rest until it puts out the light, whether it means killing mind, heart, or spirit. Sadly, the ones who with a generous heart affirm and accept this light as a gift to the community are not as persistent in their praise, and so it was with St. John. As we wrote in our chapter on St. Teresa of Avila, convents were in dire need of reform. Could it be this young friar striving toward living the strict rule of their founder, St. Albert, was a threat to others in the community, reminding them of what they could be and were not? They scourged him. Three times a week, St. John bared his shoulders so the friar in charge could discipline him for his own good, of course. Did he gather strength as he was being chastised? Was he being asked to accompany Christ following the path he had walked? Did St. John see the Savior before him as he took his blows, his Lord who did not defend himself? Was this his way of sharing 
the Lord's passion with him. Rather than flee from the pain, St. John embraced suffering, refusing every comfort. His peace came through each new flower of sacrifice he could place in the basket he, like the little boy at Cafarnum, could offer his crucified Lord. He was ordained in the Cathedral of Salamanca. Four years of studying with the greatest minds at the university no longer held the young friar. Medicine, astronomy, law, philosophy, even theology no longer fulfilled him. He longed for a more intense life, a closer encounter with his Lord. A romantic, St. John had a yearning to be silent and to know his God. He would seek this God in the silent order of the Carthusians. On the way to Segovia to join the Carthusians, St. John stopped at that same chapel where he had celebrated his first mass and where he had been received as a novice. With his family there beside him, he celebrated mass once more. He would return one day to this same chapel to attend the first chapter of the reformed Descalz Carmelite Friars of Medina. Now God, the great chess player, has been moving his pieces into position. He has a great battle to win. He will begin by placing his queen, St. Teresa, in the path of his knight, St. John. Together they will checkmate the black knight who threatens his church. And so while St. John is returning from Salamanca, his dreams and future plans neatly defined, probably whistling happily as he arrives in Medina, who should be there having arrived from opening her first convent of San Jose in Avila but Saint Teresa. This is where Teresa founded her second house. See, the first one, uh, the first one in Avila was a prototype. As soon as they were aware, as soon as the Lord felt she had gotten all the kinks out of it, Five years, he urged her to begin a second house because he had many houses in mind for St. Teresa to found. Now, Medina was a natural as far as she was concerned. It was two days by mule ride from Avila. She never wanted a house to be a, a farther distance from that because Teresa of Avila, although she founded her first house at 50, visited every one of the houses that she founded, 17 in all. This was to be her second. It was also a natural because it was a larger city and, and she felt there would be many souls here to save. They donated a house to her and they arrived, uh, the ladies arrived here at night and uh, oh, what they encountered was garbage. It was really in a terrible state. But they gladly singing all the way, they cleaned it out, they put up some wall hangings and Teresa did the first thing, the most important thing that she did when she founded a house. She found a home for her Lord. She used to smile whenever people said, I wish I had lived when Jesus walked the earth. Because she knew that Jesus was as physically present today as he was then. And she knew that the only way that he was truly physically with us was in the Blessed Sacrament, so she made a home for her Lord. That night they celebrated Mass. She was as happy as could be. They went to sleep, but when she got up the next morning, she was horrified because her Lord had been very unprotected the night before. There had been holes in the wall they hadn't seen in the dark, and anyone could have come in and taken our Lord. She was also afraid the heretics would do so because the heretics of that time would like to get their hands on a consecrated host so they could desecrate our Lord in this way. And so she immediately looked for other quarters. A man very generously donated a couple of rooms in his home. But Teresa was not even satisfied with that. She left what she called watchmen with our Lord. And not even trusting that, afraid that they might sleep during the night, fall asleep, 
she would all night long get up and check up on our Lord. Of course, they knew that this was too small, but the man added a couple of rooms, and this room that you're in right now is the original house that Teresa founded here in Medina. Now, a young man just happened to be here. His name was John Matthias. John uh, was a Carmelite. In fact, he had said his first mass here in Medina. He lived in Medina for many years as a child. But he was very dissatisfied with the Carmelites. There was not enough spirituality. There was not enough contemplative life. And so he was considering joining the Carthusian monks. When he came here and he met Teresa, she was 55 and he, no, she was 52 and he was 25. And yet he fell in love with her. He knew immediately that anything this woman asked, he would give her. And so she said, don't go into the Carthusian jet. Let me build you a monastery. Give me six months. Give me a year. Because she knew that the Lord had called John of the Cross, and that's what he was later named, to begin the first male order of the Discalced Carmelites of the Reform. Now, when we talk about Teresa and John having these conversations, they happened here. He on this side of the grill and she on that side of the grill. And although it was normal to do in those days, it's so hard to believe that someone would give up their lives, change their lives because of something somebody said to them from the other side of a metal grill. And yet John was so convinced that Teresa was from the Lord that he did whatever she wanted him to do. And she did open a monastery for him. About six months later or a year later in Doruelo. Bob said something, and I want to be very clear about it. He said she, he fell in love with Teresa. And if I may, I just want to explain very carefully that Teresa reflected Jesus and John reflected Jesus. And they identified with that Jesus they saw in one another. She was blindingly beautiful. But the beauty that you saw was this purity of the love she had for her Lord Jesus. And this is what John saw in her. John saw a kindred spirit. He had met no one in the world like Teresa who had the fire of Jesus burning in her. And that's what attracted him. He promised he would help and agreed to wait to join the Carthusians if it didn't take too long. St. John waited until autumn. He was restless. He wanted to be about his dream. He struggled. Determined to fight the magnetic pull of Teresa on him, he set out towards Salamanca. But once there, the gnawing inside him clearly told him he had to return to Medina and his promise to St. Teresa. So back again in Medina, he meets up with St. Teresa. She asks him to join her as she is on her way to found a house in Valladolid for her sisters. She had promised to do this in the hope of rescuing the soul of one Don Bernardino from purgatory. The first mass celebrated there, she saw his soul rising to heaven, and Don Bernardino thanked her for what she had done for him. This accomplished, St. Teresa remained in Valladolid for the winter, sending St. John ahead to Duruelo. Like the saints before him, the Lord asked him for everything in Duruelo. No more consolation. He had been baptized John, professed John Matthias. Now he would earn a new name, John of the Cross. Jesus had said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And John said, yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. I have come to do your will. How often we do not recognize our afflictions as blessings. The remoteness, the poverty of Duriello, whose potential St. Teresa could foresee, became a center of religion. But no sooner had it become a place of joy than she called John away to start a community in another area. He became Teresa's troubleshooter. She sent him to different convents in Spain to take care of problems, to open houses in impossible places against impossible odds. 
No sooner would he accomplish his goal in one community than he would be called to wage and win another battle for Teresa and the reform. Teresa called John back to Avila. She needed him, she said, to act as spiritual director to her own convent of the Incarnation where she had been named prioress. Since her departure from the convent 10 years before, things had become worse if that was possible. The need for reform that Teresa had seen was even greater than it had been. Life in the monastery had become easier and easier to the point of hardly resembling the original rule. They had tried to physically bar her from entering. Pope Pius V had ordered the reform, but it would take, sadly, more than his decision to allow this to come to pass. Very tired 60-year-old Teresa lovingly responded to her sister's fury with a gentleness so powerful they were bowled over. I come only to serve you. To this end, I hope the Lord will greatly help me. For as to the rest, any of you can teach and inform me what I can do for each of you, I will do it willingly, even to the shedding of blood and giving my life. I am a daughter of this house and a sister. Do not fear my rule, for although I have lived till now amongst discalced nuns, by the Lord's mercy I know well how those who are not should be governed. Even the most hot-tempered nuns had no quarrel with this humble speech. Everything would go as before, or so they thought. A young and very foolish gay blade came calling as usual in hot pursuit of one of the young nuns. Can you imagine the look on his face when looming ominously before him was the foreboding, terrifying St. Teresa? She boomed. If he so much as thought of coming to the convent again, she'd know. She'd report him to the king and have his head cut off. Needless to say, this did not endear her to the other nuns. She became really more like a prisoner than a prioress, no longer feeling at home in the convent of her early days. Her thoughts went back to her childhood, when she knelt before this painting of Jesus and the woman at the well, begging him, Lord, give me of this water to drink. Was she aware of the suffering she'd been asking for? Had she realized Jesus was asking her to give up family and friends, the friendship of the sisters in her community, everyone and everything for him? Would she have been able to make that sacrifice? The older Teresa, now prioress, prayed before the painting once more. Her answer was a resounding, yes, yes. She went down to the cell where she had spent 27 years before beginning the reform. This room was where it had all started. She recalled the need the Lord showed her for a reform. The walk away from Jesus was subtle. The incarnation was a convent of holy nuns, but problems arose because of the never-ending stream of visitors coming and going. Although these callers were very often loving and good, they were bringing their world and its allure into the world of the nuns and the Incarnation. Teresa was to painfully discover in her day, just as we will in ours, either we, the Church, evangelize to the world, or the world will evangelize to us. An example of the seriousness of the problem, one of the elder nuns strongly cautioned Teresa to stop seeing one of her friends that her talk, more like gossip, was a threat to Teresa's soul. The older Teresa, now looking back over her life, could see the advisability and wisdom of following the nuns' admonitions. But the younger Teresa had chosen to ignore them, conveniently judging the nun too old and too worried about too little. The Lord had been carefully planting flowers of perfection in the souls of the nuns of the Incarnation forming them into a heavenly bouquet for himself. But they, instead of living more fully this new life with the Lord, Teresa included, were looking forward more and more to news of the outside world. Teresa had been slowly but surely sacrificing her prayer life and eventually her Lord by being unwittingly tempted by her friends, the world, and its vanities. 
And so our Lord, as a gardener, pruning shears in hand, appeared to Teresa one day when she was entertaining the friend the nun had warned her about. She became aware of the Lord's presence. I saw him with the eyes of my soul more clearly than I could see him with the eyes of my body. It made such an impression that even now, 26 years later, she could feel that presence before her, just as he had that day. It had been enough for her. She never saw that person again. Teresa knew she had to reform first before reform would come about in her community. To this end, she plunged into deep prayer and meditation. She had a vision in this room of our Lord Jesus at the pillar, bleeding, bruised, and broken. Prostrating herself before him, she begged him to release her from the bondage of the liar with his false gifts of the world and the flesh. She asked his forgiveness for the many times she'd foolishly been tempted by people and things of the world. My Lord and my God, I will not get up from here until you grant me this favor. This was the turning point in Teresa's life. She had passionately prayed with her heart and soul and the Savior responded as he did when walking the earth. Your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and walk. In later years, when the papal nuncio denounced her, describing St. Teresa as a restless, roving, disobedient female, she prayed and meditated before this statue of our Lord Jesus at the pillar, which most resembled the vision she had had. She carried the statue everywhere she went for the rest of her life. Teresa continued her lone journey to the Lord, digging deeper and deeper within herself, closing out the world, focusing on Jesus. She recalled the time when, deep in prayer, she'd received what she called a terrifying caress, a transverberation of her heart. She'd seen an angel to the left of her. He was small and very beautiful, so illuminated, he had to be one of the very highest of the angels, the cherubim. He had a long golden dart in his hand, with what appeared to be fire at the end of it. She could still feel him thrusting it into her heart several times, piercing her down to her innermost organs, leaving her burning with a great love of God. After St. Teresa's death, when they investigated her heart, it appeared to be pierced through the center as if by a dart. In 1872, at the request of the prioress of Alba de Tormes, three physicians, professors of medicine and surgery at the University of Salamanca, examined Teresa's heart. They found the heart still incorrupt and untouched by the ravages of death. After almost 300 years, the heart was punctured on both sides, leaving a perforation above the left and right oracles, verifying what Teresa had said. The idea of the reform started almost playfully in jest. Some of the nuns and some lay women had been in Teresa's cell. Their favorite subject had come up again, the need for more solitude and their desire to live a truly monastic life, free from the outside influences of the many visitors who frequented the Incarnation. Why don't we start a reform right here in the Incarnation? It was a young nun, Teresa's niece, Maria del Campo, who started it all with a suggestion. But it was Teresa who said yes. Having held this in her heart all those years, upon hearing the young nun's words, she knew it was the Lord talking through her. One morning, after Teresa had received her beloved Lord in Holy Communion, she felt him next to her. He let it be known that the reform was his will and that he would be at one door and his mother at the other, protecting them. He'd even given her the name of the convent. He said it was to be named after his foster father on earth, St. Joseph. 
when Mary and Joseph placed this cloak of white roses and jewels on her, she felt like she had been baptized, and all her sins that she had ever committed had been forgiven. And now, 10 years later, she felt so alone. She longed for the houses she had founded, especially her first, the convent of San Jose. Her family, in supporting her, had suffered mercilessly. Her sister Juana and her husband had been supervising the construction of San Jose one day when they entered the house. There they found their tiny son pinned under part of a wall that had fallen on him. They carried their little boy's lifeless body over to where Teresa was staying that day. Teresa had placed the child on her lap. She prayed to our Lord, and he answered her. After a short while, the child lifted his hands one by one and began to play with her. Teresa thought of many things during this time when she was prioress of the Incarnation. She wanted to be back with her sisters in the kitchen, sharing with them, laughing with them, playing their instruments, never a sour-faced nun among any of them, with God ever present even there amongst the pots and pans. Teresa's cell in the convent of San Jose held such fond memories for her. Here she had spent five of the happiest, most peaceful years of her life. She recalled fondly her little bed and the wooden log she used for a pillow. But for Teresa, the most important part of this room was the little window seat where she'd looked out onto the beauty of Avila as she wrote three of her greatest works, her life, the way of perfection, and interior castles. But more than San Jose or Medina or any of the houses she had founded these last 10 years, she missed having a spiritual director. So who does she call to the convent of the Incarnation but John? She knew she could count on this eager, well-balanced, uncompromising mystic to not only direct her, but she knew she could trust him to counsel the other nuns in her care. St. John was to guide all the nuns in the convent wisely for the next five years. Teresa was so proud of him. Although he was only 30 years old, in some cases as young or younger than the nuns he directed, he gained their confidence and respect. What she so deeply admired about him was his lack of guile, his gentleness in handling sinners in the confessional, his patience. Sometimes these attracted women whose focus was not his own. One day, one such woman forced her way into his confessional. She had fallen violently and a little more than demonstratively in love with him. Little is written how he handled the situation, but it is recorded she left in peace, tears streaming down her face. They influenced each other's writing, Saints Teresa and John. She, infused and taught by God himself, use the everyday evidence of God's presence among us, not only in the Eucharist, but that God among the pots and pans. He, the learned poet, wrote, influenced by much of his theological and philosophical wisdom. They inspired one another, each contributing insights to the other. Let us therefore put the love of Jesus above all things, he that clings to a creature shall fall with what is frail, but he that throws his arms around Jesus shall grow forever stronger. He will never leave you. There is no surer road than that of the Holy Cross. Come unto Jesus and he will refresh you. Teresa loved our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist. In order to feel his presence within her longer, she would always ask to receive the large host, judging it would take longer for the host to dissolve. Now, she and John had a very special relationship, but he was a hard spiritual director. One day, 
to impress obedience and humility on her, he gave her just the tiniest particle of the host at communion time. She obediently but reluctantly accepted. We're not sure how pleased she was, but our Lord Jesus was extremely pleased with this daughter. She had a vision of Jesus. He said, no one will have the power to separate you from me. Until now, you had not deserved it, but now you are my spouse. All that is mine is yours. And he took her for his bride, handing her one of the nails that had pierced his sacred body. Their peace and joy was short-lived. A scandal struck. A widowed princess coerced her way into one of Teresa's convents. Receiving many men to console her, the widow not only brought scandal upon herself, but the Inquisition's suspicions upon St. Teresa. They accused her of being in accord with the princess, and so Teresa and John found themselves in hot water again. By the grace of God, the princess was judged solely responsible. St. Teresa chose a young man of the Spanish court, Gracian, as superior to her community at Pastrana. That would surely put a mind at rest. Not really. The general of the Carmelite order got his feathers ruffled when Gratian failed to inform him of his every move. He wrote to Teresa. She never got the letter. He got no answer. Silence angered him. She was evading him. Patience wins all. Just words of St. Teresa, or were they cries from within the depths of her heart? And how did this affect St. John? Tostado, vicar general of the Carmelites and feared head honcho of the Inquisition, had been swayed by the general against her. Tostado did everything to prevent her from being elected prioress, even to the point of excommunicating the 50 nuns who voted for her, determined to support their mother. Oh, he was furious with these nuns who would not back down. He needed somebody to blame. Blame St. John the Friar, their spiritual director. Failing to persuade the fragile friar, he arrested St. John and a companion, beat them, and then placed them in separate cells. Teresa went to the king. Meanwhile, Tostado's plan was terrify them, break their wills. He threw St. John into a cell too small for even his tiny body. He was allowed to leave only those rare moments when he was given some bread and water to eat from the floor. When he finished food not fit for a dog, one, not to waste an opportunity, the jailers bared his back and mercilessly scourged him over and over again, the whips ripping its skin already hanging. Mental abuse was added to physical. The Spaniards had learned their lessons well when they were occupied. When they finished degrading him, they sent John and his companion back into the aloneness of solitary confinement again. As he spent eight long months in prison, now in Toledo, he reflected on how even good men had the potential of wickedness. And on this occasion, of course, it was for the good of Mother Church. No amount of lies, no amount of threats, not even deadly monotony, nor food so foul he thought he was being poisoned, no amount of beatings that even a strong, healthy man could not survive could make St. John give up his allegiance to St. Teresa and the reform. In his pain and torment of body and soul, St. John of the Cross began to compose one of the most beautiful Spanish verses. The silence laid invisible hands upon my heart, and the night knew me. Was this revealed to St. John as he suffered the torments of prison, the hours slowly ticking away into days, into weeks, into months, into what must have seemed at time eternity. On August 15th, Feast of the Assumption, St. John was so weakened by the intense heat in his cell he did not recognize his jailer, who asked St. John what had he been thinking. 
St. John asked for the consolation of celebrating Mass. The jailer ran true to form and refused. But that night, Our Lady appeared to St. John and promised him he would escape. One week later, St. John escaped. Opening the door of his cell, he walked past the jailers, sleeping soundly beside him. He lowered himself down the wall, fleeing through the night, not knowing where he was going. His only guide was a dog who ran ahead of him. Finally, he found himself at the convent of San Jose. He remained there for a few months. Things did not get better for this little remnant of the Lord. Teresa was forbidden to move from Avila. Everything was against Teresa and St. John of the Cross. Too few friars with too many enemies, their houses taken away from them. There was little hope. Or was there? There was the Spanish court. Teresa had the king in her corner. He didn't appreciate an Italian interfering with a Spanish court and its affairs. An order was issued suspending all action against the reform, relieving the nuncio of any further authority in the matter. St. John of the Cross had endured the long nights of his imprisonment. Now over, he sought and did not find consolation in his poetry. His mind went blank. Now his heart robbed of every human solace. St. John turned to and found his loving God. This was his sanity, this faithful God. At times, clinging only by his fingertips to the Lord's promise that he would never leave him. While all this was going on, St. John was separated from St. Teresa and his many friends. Although the countryside where he was staying had been all his heart had desired, a perfect place to go away and know his Lord in the silence of the Sierra Mountains, it only served to remind him painfully of all that he had been through and what his reformed family was still suffering. With this haunting him, he began writing The Dark Night of the Soul. He spoke of renouncing self, the death of the memory, to raise the will above itself to the heights when it can glimpse God and begin to know him. The dark night of the soul is but another name for the narrow way by which we pass to the perfection of love, which is blessed union with God. Only by making God the center of our lives, giving over to him the four passions that dominate our life, joy, hope, grief, and fear, then and then alone can we love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind, our soul, and our strength. The dark night of the soul was written by a man who took the cross as his sign, who lived and wrote through that sign. But although he spoke only of holy things, he was far from what you would call a sour-faced saint. He did so with so much joy that his friars, the ones he directed, loved to hear him. They sought out his company, even during their free time walking in the garden. They said he would make us all laugh. St. John was a man who loved passionately. He had learned to love and to write with that love. He wrote to his Lord his love. If I see not thee, what use have eyes? For St. Teresa, her reform was now legitimate. She was so proud of everything her friars were doing. It all seemed like a wonderful dream. But her work completed, her battle fought and won, Teresa was feeling the cost of all those years of struggle. She was getting ready to go home. If only she could see St. John of the Cross once more. She wrote to a provincial asking to see her little friar. Her request was denied. For his part, St. John longed to return to his beloved Castile and Teresa. At last, his and St. Teresa's wish would be granted. It had been suggested a house of nuns be founded at Granada. It was decided St. John would be the best to send to Avila to beg St. Teresa to found the house. So now, five years from the last time they had seen each other, 
the two friends would meet. This friar she so loved was her single greatest consolation. She had become lonely in Avila. She missed visiting her houses, the excitement of new places and new hopes, the adrenaline pumping battles fought and won. Now her body was worn out. It had grown old, but not her spirit. With her ever young friar St. John here with her, even her old bones seemed young again. But St. Teresa had struggles and disappointments till the very end. Only now, it was amongst her beloved in her reform. She died on her way once more to straighten out problems and to put one of her houses in order. Too sick to go on at Alba de Tormes, a very tired Teresa gave up her spirit to the spouse she had always loved. On October the 4th, her face took on a youthful brilliance. She was beautiful. Her words, at last, at last, a daughter of the church, her last act of faith and obedience uttered, she recited the miserere, and her spirit took flight like a butterfly being released out of a cocoon. Gracian had been Teresa's choice as provincial, but while he was a diplomat and well-liked, he was incompetent. Now he was being replaced. St. John's new superior was not even a Spaniard, but an Italian. Gracian was loved but not trusted. Doria, the new provincial, was trusted but not loved. Although he knew well the faults and shortcomings of Gracian, St. John felt impelled to warn the friars. No amount of pleading could change the minds of the friars. They voted Gracian out and Doria in, and then it began. Dorian proved to be a tyrant. If he could have, he would have expelled Gracian, but he couldn't, so he sent him to Mexico. But even Mexico was not far enough. So bringing Gracian before the Inquisition, he accused him of publishing a pamphlet without his permission. And if that wasn't enough, he added that Gracian was having intercourse with the nuns. Gracian was expelled from the order. It was Teresa's turn. Teresa's nuns attacked them. Since St. Teresa was the rule rather than the exception, the strong Spanish women did not just lie down and die. St. John of the Cross got up in the assembly and spoke defending Teresa and her nuns. Doria lay in wait. As he listened to John, Doria hatched a, another plan. Send him to Segovia as prior. That's how he'd silence him, at least for now. St. John waited from 1589 to 1591 in Segovia for the other shoe to drop. He knew that Dory would never be satisfied until he was gone for good. He built his little convent with his own bare hands. He was content. But a friend, a good friend, pursued John's cause in Rome. She testified that Doria was really going against Teresa's reform. Her petition was granted. St. John was exonerated. When news got back to Doria, at first he raged and ranted, then he plotted. He tried scandal, smearing the good names of Saints John and Teresa. When that failed, he decided he would exile St. John to Mexico. St. John would not go peacefully to Mexico. Not content with saving his life, St. John not only defended the nuns whose good names Doria had tried to destroy, but Gracian as well. St. John was deprived of his offices and made again a simple friar. St. John was sent into exile, into lonely Pinuela, 
to the mountainous ranges of Sierra Nevada. Here, he would find peace until another enemy struck, now a physical one. The friars had to take St. John to Ubeda. He had a raging fever, and they thought they would, that they would be able to get some help there. His trip seemed endless as his aching body bobbed up and down on a mule. His tongue stuck to his palate as his temperature rose, ulcers ripping away at his stomach like ground glass, unable to eat anything but a little asparagus. When he arrived at Ubeda, the prior, remembering how he had once been reprimanded by St. John, put him in the coldest, dampest, tiniest cell he could find. The weeks painfully passed. On December the 14th, John grew silent. There was an aura of perfect, peaceful light surrounding him, enveloping and cradling him. He exclaimed, I shall be tonight in heaven. As he said the words, into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, the friar who had been holding him saw a triple crown encircling his head. As a sweet perfume filled the air, St. John no longer suffered. He had breathed his last. His face was radiant. So went the little Carmelite, friend and helper, on his last journey to his last house. The contrasting personalities of St. John and Teresa complemented each other, creating a harmonious song like the angels as they sing during the sacrifice of the Mass. They were free to accept one another and their gifts. And because of this, till today, their song still fills the air. She had the courage, the strength, and the determination of a conquistador. He had the sensitivity, the gentleness, the intuition and excitement of a newlywed Ex drinking in the honeymoon experience with his Lord. St. John was a Catholic, a Spanish Catholic, a priest, a confessor, and a poet. No matter what the cost, he lived and died a Catholic son, faithful to his vocation, to his sacrament. Oh, he loved Mother Church. He loved everything about his mother, the Church but most especially the sacrifice of the Mass. The church not only had no quarrel with her son, she raised him to the communion of saints. In 1675, he was beatified. In 1726, he was canonized. And 200 years later, he was declared by the church. He so loved and obeyed doctor of the universal church. His incorrupt body was taken from its modest grave and raised to this magnificent tribute in the church he had built with his own hands. St. John of the Cross was passionately in love with his Lord, and there was no turning back. He cautions wisely that God leads each soul along different roads, and there shall hardly be found a single spirit who can walk even half the way that is suitable for another. At the end of the living flame, St. John sums up in one short passage the mystery of God in the soul of man. God dwells secretly in all souls, hidden in their very being, for otherwise they would be unable to exist. But like the measure we shall know him in heaven, how different is the manner in he which he dwells in each soul. For in some he dwells alone, and in others not alone. In some he dwells contented, in others displeased. In some he dwells as in his house, ordering it and noting everything while in others he dwells as a stranger in a house of another, where he is not allowed to do anything or to give any commands. 
St. John wrote, a soul was not to follow the desires and designs of the heart. Rather, you must deny yourself, allow yourself to be humbled, and pray, always ready to take up and follow Jesus as he carries his cross, carrying your own. And what will be your reward? You can count on this from the world. You will be unpopular, you will lose your friends, your credit, your reputation, and even your worldly goods. The tongues of people will rise up against you. They will make fun of you and ridicule you. They will try to tempt you to go back to the way you were and the way they still are. They will use your heart against you, logic and pride, your intellect, your strengths and your weaknesses, and very often all in the name of God or at least for your own good. But Jesus' promise, I am with you always, will sustain you because the Lord will deliver you out of it all. Love produces a resemblance. The quality of a man's love is greatly influenced by what he loves. When it is by whom he loves, he is empowered by that love. These souls who love love not only the beloved or the lover, they love love. And in that case, when the love affair is with the author of all love, he fills the lover with so much love, the beloved cannot contain it, and he is changed. The love of the Lord takes over the heart of the human who loves him. Then the mind begins to enter that mystical romance that human drama cannot begin to experience or understand. The program you have just seen is part of a series based on our new book, Saints and Other Powerful Men in the Church. For more information about this book, call 1-800-OF-FAITH. That's 1-800-633-2484.